We're in a series not called What Would Jesus Do, as the bracelets were back in the day, but What Would Jesus Undo? What would Jesus undo? And last week we discussed that Jesus would undo hypocrisy. We said last week that the number one reason why people say they don't go to church is because it's all a bunch of hypocrites, right? Hypocrisy being saying one thing but doing something else or showing that you're one way but you actually live a different kind of life. What would Jesus undo? He would undo this hypocrisy in the heart. And if you didn't get a chance to be here last week, uh, you can watch it on our website. You can download the podcast. Um, but it was really, really good. And it started a lot of conversations last week. Uh, people have come up to me all week saying how they were at home talking about it or they were in their different uh, groups talking about the idea that Jesus would undo hypocrisy. So today, have you ever seen those videos either on YouTube or someone posting on Facebook or Instagram where a parent thought it would be funny to wrap a big box for Christmas for their kids and present it to their kids and their kids are all excited. They come running down, they see this box wrapped beautifully for them and they tear into the box because they know the bigger the box, the bigger the present. They rip the box open and there's nothing inside. Have you ever seen those videos? And, and the parents are sitting there laughing. Like <laughs> you can hear them laughing in the background. And then the kid has a complete meltdown. The kid throws a complete tantrum because there was nothing in the box. And they had these hopes of these, this big, huge present. And yet the parent thought that that was funny. To, to torture their child in this way, right? The child expected this huge, amazing present, but instead, they received an empty box. I began to think, what if, as in, in the church world, what if the songs we sing, and the sermons that we preach, and the acts of service that we do, wonder if sometimes they're empty gifts to God? Wonder if we think we're doing one thing and we're actually not. That, that because we follow tradition of church and we follow the rituals of church, that we actually think we're touching the heart of God. But wonder if we were just presenting an empty box to him in our worship. What if our lives are wrapped up with a spiritual image on the outside, but on the inside, because our hearts are far from God, we're actually offering God empty gifts? It's a heavy thought today. It's something that took time for me to really ration out. What would Jesus undo? He would undo vain worship. He would undo hollow worship. He would undo empty boxes of worship. What is one of those things that really upsets Jesus? I believe that vain worship upsets Jesus. And I want to show you this in Matthew's gospel. Matthew chapter 15. We'll start in verse 1. And I want to show you a very interesting conversation between some Pharisees and Jesus. In Matthew 15 verse 1 it says this. Then some Pharisees and teachers of the law came to Jesus from Jerusalem and asked, Why do your disciples break the traditions of the elders? They do not wash their hands before they eat. Why are these guys breaking our laws? They do not wash their hands before they eat. Well, we have to understand that the Pharisees were obsessed with something called ceremonial cleanliness. Ceremonial cleanliness. Now this is not the same thing as physical hygiene. Right? It's not physical hygiene. I hope that we all used proper physical hygiene this morning. I hope we all did wake up and take a shower and put deodorant on, a little splash spritzer of 
perfume or cologne, smell all pretty this morning. This is not what we're talking about. We're not talking about the fact that we all know that we need to wash ourselves before we're in public with other people. No, this is ceremonial cleansing. And they were obsessed with this. And there were two categories of things um, in the pharisaical world, okay? There were things that were clean and there were things that were unclean. Every animal was either a clean animal or an unclean animal. There were clean ways to prepare food and there were unclean ways to prepare food. Uh, there are things to touch that are clean and there are things that are unclean to touch. If you had any sort of bodily discharge, you were then unclean. If, you're, if you had a skin problem, you were unclean. If you touched a pig, you were unclean. If you touched a dead body, you were unclean. So you can see there was these two categories. There's things that were clean and things that were unclean. And the problem is that when you became unclean, your uncleanliness was contagious. Okay, it was transferable. Remember cooties in the fifth grade? You got cooties and then I touch you and now you have cooties. Right. If you got cooties, you could give cooties. If you were unclean, you could transfer being unclean. So if an unclean mouse touched a cup, the cup was unclean. And if you touched the cup that was unclean, you now became unclean. If your spouse touched you, your spouse was now unclean. Therefore, you were not fit for worship. Okay, see this. It was, it's pretty deep here. So what do you have to do then? When you were unclean, you had to go through an elaborate ceremony to be cleansed. You had to cleanse yourself spiritually so that you were prepared for worship before God. Uh, we will get much deeper into this ritual and this system on Wednesday night as we continue the conversation. Uh, but today I wanted to show you what they would do just in this hand washing thing. Why do your disciples break the law of the elders? They do not wash their hands before they eat. Now, I got to be honest with you, I'm really bad at that. I very rarely ever wash my hands before I eat. Even if I've been working on a car and I'm covered in axle grease and motor oil, I'll just grab a sandwich. I'll eat. I don't even care. You know, I just believe that when I woke up in the morning and I prayed that God would protect me, keep me safe, and cover me, that it meant everything. So I don't even care. But there's some of you in here who you're crazy. You carry a bottle of Perel with you everywhere you go, and if you touch anything, whoosh, whoosh, disinfectant, everything, I'm really bad. I don't care. I don't care, right? <laughs> Just to clean your hands, you had to take a certain amount of water known as a quarter log. We're going to break this down a little bit Wednesday. You had to take a quarter log of water. How much is a quarter log, you say? A quarter log is about an egg and a half worth of water, like a medium-sized egg. So if you kind of like broke an egg and filled it with water and then a half an egg shell, filled them with water, that was about a quarter log of water. You had to take this quarter log of water and, and, and you would have, B, could you come here for a sec? Um, I should have wore the head mic now that I'm thinking about it. Could you hold this for me? You had to take the, the quarter log of water, and Brian would have to do this for me, and I would have to take my hands and hold them like this. And he would pour that quarter log of water over my hands like this. Now, why would I have to hold my hands like this? Because the moment clean water hit my unclean hands, the water now became, what? Unclean. So now, I don't want that unclean water running down the rest of my arm. Because now the rest of my arm would be, right. So you would hold your hands like this to ensure that the water would just pass straight down. Once, once he had poured the quarter log of water over my hands, I would then turn my hands this way as to drip the water off my hands. And at that point, I could, you know, wash my hands with that water around and shake it off and go dry my hands. Thank you, Brian. I could, go, I could do it like that. This is how... 
obsessed they were with ceremonial cleansing. Now, you would think, what's wrong with that? That's very, that's very wise. That's smart to wash your hands before you eat. Oh, no, 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 no. They did this in between every course of the meal. So before you sat down to eat, you had to clean your hands. After appetizer, you had to clean your hands. After your uh, salad, you had to clean your hands. After the main dish, you had to clean your hands. After your chocolate mousse, you get what I'm saying? This, this thing was just, I don't even know how much time they must have spent washing their hands. I mean, if I washed my hands that many times, my hands would be all cracked. You know, I'd have to put lotion on them all the time. So they had this mentality, they were obsessed with cleaning their hands. And the Pharisees are asking Jesus, why don't your boys do this? Well, one, it's stupid. <laughs> we're hungry. We have time for all this nonsense. Why don't your boys do this? And Jesus unleashes on them. I mean, it, it, he's just not like... Because they don't want to. He doesn't just, you know, brush them off. He's like, do you really want to know the answer to this? Do you really want to know why I'm not enforcing? Because, again, he's teacher. He, he's respected as rabbi. He's up there. He's already got the respect of these people in that regard. How come you have not made your boys? How come you haven't disciplined them for breaking this law? And he says, you're not even treating people with respect. You're not even showing love to other people, and you want to ask them about why they aren't washing their hands? I think sometimes we see that in church. People who get caught up with the rules of church, the rules of serving, what has to be done, where things have to go, and they forget that there's going to be somebody walking in the church today hurting. There's going to be somebody walking into church today who just needs a hug. And if we get so caught up with the job at church and we miss the ministry of church. He says your hearts aren't even connected with God. And here you are obsessing over all these externals when internally you are so far from being right. I think that that was part of the issue with having the Ten Commandments or having the law. Just tell me what to do. Just give me the law so I don't have to have a relationship with God. He's saying, wait, wait, wait. That's the problem. This whole thing is supposed to be about relationship. Not about doing right or doing wrong. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. He's saying it's about a relationship with God, not about having all the behaviors right. You want to dog these guys because they're not washing their hands, but you don't even walk with me. You don't even talk with me. You don't even have a true relationship with the Savior of the world. He called them hypocrites, and he points out, that they're full of vain worship. He says, you worship with your lips and your rituals, but you have never worshipped me with your heart. Man, I think about this. How easy could it be to get caught up in a moment of church where, man, the, the band is just right, the sound man has the mix just right, the haze is nice and thin in the air, but we can see every beam of light. And we're singing a song that just melodically hits our heart. So, yeah, we're in it. I'm coming back to the heart of worship where it's all about you. But we don't actually mean it. We're just singing the song. Or better yet. There's people who are connecting with Jesus all over the room. And there's an anointing in the room. And we're there at our seat. Because we've got to lean on the one in front of us. This is what we would call vain 
and empty worship. In Matthew 15, 7, he says this to the Pharisees, you hypocrites. Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. He said, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me, what? In vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. You, you, you simply follow the rules of engagement when it comes to church, but you haven't taken time to know me, to know me, to have a relationship with me. Jesus says they're worshiping me in vain. They, their worship isn't pleasing to me. On the outside, it looks something like worship. But because the inside is not right, it's simply an empty gift. It's hollow worship. It's worship that does not touch the heart of God. It's worship that is in vain. What would Jesus undo? He would undo a show on the outside, a hypocritical expression, a pretend faith, a, hey, everybody, I'm kind of a Christian, when the inside, your heart is very, very far from truly worshiping God. I would say, that as a church at large, or the church in America, we have a lot of potential to grow in our heartfelt expressions of worship to God. Okay? I was inspired this week studying this topic. And I feel that part of the calling of this church is to release a declaration over the Hudson Valley next Friday night in Albany that will set the course of a spiritual awakening in the Hudson Valley. I believe that we are, we are called to be part of a spiritual awakening to the Northeast. They say, they say, the world says, pastors say, church world says, that the Northeast is the hardest ground to till when it comes to building the church. You know, I don't know why. Be, and I'm just going to throw it out there. You could disagree with me all you want. But the, the, the biggest issue with the Northeast is that our biblical views don't match our world views. Our, 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 our biblical views do not match our political views. They don't speak the same thing. That, that, that somehow because somebody said there's a separation of church and state, that we think that it's cool to separate our beliefs, our core values of Christianity and our political values. I'm just throwing it out there. Check yourself on it. But it's, it, it, many times we can be full of vain worship, especially in the liberal Northeast. I believe that we would not just preach sermons and sing songs about revival and about miracles, but I believe that all across the Northeast, Christians will raise up and be revival and that we will be miracles in people's lives. We're not called to just sing songs about miracles. We are to be a miracle. Our life is to be a miracle. Our speech is to be a miracle. We're not singing songs, do it again, God. Come to, we're waiting for you to arrive, God. He says, no, I've sent you to where you are. I've sent you to that job. I've sent you to that family to be the difference, to be the light. Jesus is saying, stop talking about worship. Stop performing tasks that look like worship and be worship. Be worship. Mm. So let me unwrap this. When the church talks about this word worship, we immediately imagine and an image comes to mind where we're talking about singing songs in church. When we say the word worship, that's the first thing we think about. Okay, our worship experience, our worship expression, our worship time with God. And we're going to sing songs of praise and worship. And so we get confused with that. And when we see in the Bible where God is commanding us to worship, we think that we have to have a good voice to do that. 
I think the church at large has done a disservice to men. And they've tried to make men sing songs and act like women during worship times. Well, because the females like to cry and cuddle up in Daddy Jesus' arms, we think that men need to respond the same way, right? And at large, the church has tried to make the church experience a a more feminine place. Come on now. And that's why a lot of men have a hard time connecting to God during a worship time because, well, show me how a man does this. All right. We mostly think about music. We mostly think, well, I like Hillsong worship. I like Elevation worship. Well, I like my hymnal book. And because the church that we attended doesn't do the style of music that we like, I can't go there. I can't go to that church. Their worship just doesn't feed me. Their worship just doesn't you know, ignite my spirit. You're talking about melodic preference. You're so far from worship. If there was never a keyboard and never a guitar and never a light show, could you still worship? See, because it's not about somebody else leading you somewhere. It's about you being worship. Who you are should be worship. Okay, we're going to get, we're unpacking this, all right? Well, Pastor Mike, I like a more reserved and quiet worship style. And then you have the other, no way, I like it loud, passionate worship. The louder, the better. We got to have the haze, we got to have the lights. And the debate breaks out about worship style. Worship style. So which is correct? Is hymnals and a quieter, reserved style better? Or is a loud rock band, you know, you got the bass player going crazy. Is that correct? Like which one's correct? Is it soft music where it's comfortable and easy or loud and aggressive? Which is correct? And if one is correct, then which one's wrong? Is it wrong to enjoy our Father which art in heaven? Or ah, Jesus. Which one's wrong? So let's look, which one's correct? Which one is correct? Softer, more melodic, or Heavy metal Jesus worship, which is correct. Both. Which one is wrong? Both. Both are correct and both are wrong. Both can be correct when your heart is correct. And both can be wrong when your heart is wrong. See, you can't do right worship with a wrong heart. And you can't do wrong worship with a right heart. Because when your heart is right, it's right worship. But when you come into a place and you can't, I can't enter in here. It's not the church's problem, that's your problem. That's you as a believer's problem, that you can't worship because the style doesn't match your preference. That's not, well, and, and, and this is why people leave churches. The music's too loud. Bring earplugs. I mean, for real, think about it for a second. You would, you would not go somewhere because the singing isn't what you enjoy but you're being fed such true gospel that we rather go to a place that waters down the gospel because their music suits us better. I would say that's vain worship. That's an empty box of worship. Right? I think 
This is what makes me the most upset in church today. You can put this one up on the screen and quote me on this one. When people don't know the difference between talent and anointing, it probably makes me the most upset when people don't know the difference between talent and anointing. That's one of the reasons why we got rid of special music during offering. Hey, can I go there? I'm just, can I just go there? Because somebody got on stage and hey, woo, ah, and, and now everybody's like, yeah, yeah. Oh, my God, that was so amazing. Dude, that was, there was no Jesus at all in none of that. There was no, the person sang amazing. They had a beautifully talented voice, but there was no anointing whatsoever on it. And what happens is we begin to show worship to the performer instead of worship to Jesus. A talented performance, the performer receives, receives praise, put up on the screen. And an anointed worshiper, God gets all the praise. A talented performance, the performer receives the praise. Oh my gosh, yeah, that was amazing. You did so good. An anointed worship. People say, oh, God is so good. As we were singing that song, the Holy Spirit just touched me. I felt renewed. I felt revived. There's, there's, there's a difference. And I think a lot of times, I think this is one of the things that makes me the most upset is when people can't tell the difference. See, I've been to concerts, secular concerts, where the performance was great. I mean, I was feeling it. Because music touches our soul. It does. But that doesn't mean that there was one ounce of God's anointing on it. There's a difference. And I think that this is what upsets the heart of God. If he could undo something, he would undo something that looks really, really, really close to worship. But it's empty. He would undo it. See, I want to bring you to a place of true worship. Of true worship. We have to understand that Christianity is not a hobby for us. It's not a special interest group for us. It's not a label for us. If we're a follower of Jesus Christ, then Christ is our life. Then Christ is our life. Listen, worship isn't just songs we sing, but worship is the life we live. You can put that up on the screen. Worship isn't just songs we sing, but worship is the life we live. We should live a life of worship. Mm. Does, does, does your life resemble a life of worship? I want to give you five ways that we worship God. As I begin to say this today, I want, and I, my, my prayer for the last few days has been as I begin to say some of these things, that inside of you, there would be a break. There would be that, that break of a wall, of a facade. Maybe you've been attending church for a while and you said, there's got to be more to this. How come I'm not feeling free? I'm not feeling delivered. I'm still struggling so badly bad with things that I tried to lay down the, at the beginning of my Christian walk and I'm still having a hard time. I'm still struggling with this one thing. Has Christ become your life? Or is he a special interest on the weekends? Is it a hobby of things we do? Is he an add-on to our operating system? Or is he the operating system for those computer nerds in the house? I want to give you five postures, five things that we find in the Word of God about worship. The first one is this. In worship, sometimes we bow in reverence. 
Sometimes we bow in reverence. If your posture has never changed, if, if you've never been in a worship expression or a worship experience or a worship environment or even at your house where you felt the presence of God in such a way that you just had to bow down. <sighs> See, that's kind of what my bow down looks like. Other people, you know, they, they go straight uh, Judaism, you know, and they got to go all the way down. They've got, they've got to do that. For me, when I, when, sometimes when I'm feeling the presence of God, whew, sometimes I got to catch my breath. Whew. Sometimes I'm in my office and I'm writing something that I know that the Holy Spirit gave me just to touch somebody's life and I got to get up and just, whew. wow. Man, God, do you want me to say that? You want me to say that? The psalmist David said in Psalm 95, 6, come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. He said that we could kneel in reverent submission. We could say words like, you are a holy God. And I mean, when you think about that, you're holy. You're just. You are righteous. That does something in you where you just kind of have to, I can't even walk around and ponder that. You're a holy God. When I think that the angels in heaven for all eternity, it says that they've bowed down and said, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. I I think of that posture that his presence is so amazing that they just have to. Whoa. Whoa. See, you can choose to kneel now, or we could be forced to kneel later. The Bible says, one day, every knee will bow to the name of Jesus. Well, I don't believe in God. It don't matter whether you believe or not. One day, you're going to bow. One day, the Satanist is going to bow. I just got to tell you the truth. Everybody goes to heaven. Every single person that has ever existed is going to heaven. But not everybody's staying there. It might just be the pass-through. Neil, yes, sir. Out. I don't know. I just made that up. But true story, every knee is going to bow. I'd rather do it on my terms. I'd rather make it a part of a heartfelt expression of worship to God now while my knees are still good. Sometimes, and maybe you've never tried this. I mean, this is just so normal for me, but maybe you've never tried this. Maybe you've only ever gone to like a Methodist-style church, and coming in here, just walking in these doors freaks you out. But sometimes we lift our hands in adoration. Sometimes we lift our hands up, and we worship God. You know, this isn't a weird thing. This isn't a Bible thing. Paul said that we lift up holy hands. The psalmist said, I will praise you as long as I live, and, I will, and, and in your name I will lift up my hands. David was saying these things while he was in the wilderness, while he was out running for his life. He was saying these kind of things. He's like, I'm not in the temple doing this. I'm out in the fields. I'm out in a cave hiding for my life. God, you are a merciful and gracious God. He's got his hands up. This is also a sign of surrender. If my life is now in Christ, I surrender. Christ, I surrender to you. I've been trying to do this in my own strength and my own way far too long. I can't kick this habit, this addiction. I surrender. I can't kick this anger, this temper. I can't kick these bad thoughts. I surrender. I surrender. Now, I don't even have to sing a song to do this. I can just talk. 
I reach my hands towards the heavens, God. I need you. More and more every day, I need you in my life. I'm, I've been struggling lately. This is, this is what we can do. This is worship. I've been struggling lately. I don't know if I'm coming or going. I don't know if I'm making the right decisions. I don't know if people are for me or against me. But God, the word says that you have always been for me. That you would never be against me. Beyond that, you go before me and you make a way. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You're, you're with me. This changes things. Sometimes we dance in celebration. Sometimes that's a, that, that's, that's a part of our worship experience. Jeff made a commitment to God years ago. He said, God, I will always give you my best. And if you watch this guy on a Sunday during praise and worship, he was actually on guitar today. The guy dances his heart out every single worship experience. But that's what God's called in him. You know, we had this guy in church. His name was Curtis. He's since gone to be with the Lord. But this guy, Curtis, would dance in church so free. Now, his style of dance did not impress me much. His style of dance, in fact, scared me because I was like, God, I want to dance before you, but don't make me dance like that. But my man was free. He would jump, he would go across the he would jump across the, all the front of the church and dance all, you know, crazy. And I just said, God, I want to be free like that. I want to be free to express myself in worship and not care one bit. And, and I find this today that we are so bound up in pride. I couldn't worship like that. Wonder if someone sees me as if you are so popular, everybody's watching you. Get over your self-righteous self. It is not that big a deal. Because you ain't thinking that when you had six drinks at the club on Front Street last night. And you were out there doing some nasty dancing. We just say, could you simply just... Sometimes we dance in celebration. Psalm 149 verse 3 let them praise him with the dance. It's so funny that we'll dance for the most stupid things. Got that new iPhone for Christmas. Yeah! Yeah! For an iPhone. You ever dance like that for Jesus? Girls, you got asked on a date. Oh, my God! That boy asked me out! Huh? Your team wins. You're a big fan. You're at the game. Your team wins. Yo! We won! Yeah, chest bump! But for some reason, that's not acceptable posture behavior in the house of God. I think we're going to do that one day. You know, as, as you get your seat, just chest bump five people. David said that, God, you will turn my weeping into dancing. Dude, could you ever see yourself dancing yourself out of a crummy situation? Turning the backslide into the moonwalk. <laughs> you feel yourself going far from God, could you dance back into his presence? Hmm. Number four, am I in four? Number four, sometimes we worship with a sacrifice of praise. Now, this kind of changes posture, doesn't it? Because the other ones, we definitely know that we're singing songs or we're, 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 we're doing something with our body. But Hebrews 13, 15 says, Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise. Most times, we're willing to worship God when we feel Him. But can you worship Him when you don't feel Him? When you feel far from Him, 
When you feel like, oh my God, the pressure of this situation is overwhelming, could we then offer a sacrifice of worship? See, many times we worship when we're full of joy and we're joyful and we're happy and things are good. But can we worship when we're in the low? Can we worship when we feel like we're in that dark hole of depression? Can we worship? Can we realize that, yes, I might find myself in the depths of depression today, but God is here with me. Even though I'm in the valley of a shadow of death right now, I have to fear no evil because he is with me. In any season of my life, he's with me. I can worship you now because you're with me. I don't feel so good about myself, but I feel great about you, God. He's with me. Our worship isn't based on our circumstances. Our worship is based on his character. I can worship you. I can worship you. I can worship you. I don't just attend worship services. I am worship. People feel the presence of, the, of God not because they came to church, but because I am here. Come on, somebody. This is the mentality that we have to have. People, people didn't feel the presence of God because God lives in a building. God lives in you. They didn't feel the presence of God because Pastor Mike's been praying for the services. It's because they sat next to you. You are worship. The last one is this, number, number five. Daily, we lay down our lives as an act of worship. Romans 12, one says this, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Worship isn't just songs we sing. It's the life we live. Worship is not just songs that the church puts together in a nice song set all the same key doing it just right. When you wake up in the morning, the moment you breathed in that first breath of conscious air, you have begun a day of worship. Everything you touch is a worship to God. You should be a worship to God. You are a miracle to God, and you should be a miracle to someone else throughout your day. So who is God? Who is God? Can we just take a second and worship him for who he is? I wrote down a couple things. He is our rock and our redeemer. He is our righteousness. God is our deliverer and our defense. He is our strength and our shield. And he is my salvation. He is the bread of life, the living water that we drink. He is the good shepherd, the true vine. He is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the light of the world. He's the lamb of God. He's the lion of Judah. He's all powerful. He's all knowing. He's ever present. He is my alpha and my omega. He's my beginning and my end. He's my morning, my afternoon, and my evening. He's my reason for breathing. He is the ever reason I'm alive today. He's my protector and my shield. Do you know this same God that I know? Can you worship him for bringing you through? Can you worship him because he gave you breath today? Can you worship him? Even if you don't feel so good about yourself, can you feel good about who he is? He's alive forevermore. He's not a dead God. Can you worship him because he called you by name? Maybe you're like me and you realize that maybe a lot of what you've done has been vain worship. So I've come to church and let someone worship for me. I live my, day, my life all day long without a second thought of who God is in my day because I'm doing my job. My job's got no room to think about God. Maybe you're already a believer, you've been a Christian for a long time, and you realize today that there just needs to be a break in that. 
that you could actually feel today the anointing of God that I'm feeling all over me. And you know, you know, yes, the Hudson Valley needs this Jesus. The Hudson Valley needs God in their daily lives in this exact same way. If you're here today and you say, you know, Pastor Mike, I need that next step. I need that next breakthrough in my worship with God. Yeah, I have limited him to, to being just here on a Sunday or a Wednesday or maybe listening to music, but my life hasn't become an instrument of worship yet. If you're already a believer and you say, hey, you know what, Pastor Mike, would you pray with me today that I could increase my life of worship, that I could see that Christ is the center of my life? Would you raise your hand and say, hey, Pastor Mike, pray with me today? That's me. Me too. Me too. Amen. Good. Let's pray. Father, we thank you today. We thank you today that we could be the instrument of worship, that we don't have to wait for the instruments to play to worship, but we could be worship in our daily lives, that our hearts are not far from you, but our hearts are knitted tightly to you, that our hearts beat to the same rhythm, that we would reach the lost and that we would grow in our relationship with you, that we would reach the lost and grow in our relationship with you, that we would reach the lost and grow in our relationship. Let us be the light to this world. Let us be the next generation Jesus sent to this world to tell others about who you are. I thank you, Lord, today for a deeper understanding in the hearts of every believer what you created us to do. Now, if you're here today and you've never had an opportunity to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, we want to pray with you today. And here at Family Church, we make it very simple. Everybody in the room, we pray it together. So if you pray with me, it goes just like this. Dear God, I come to you just like I am. I believe that Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. I believe that he died on the cross and he rose for me. Jesus I accept you now into my life to change me and to make me new. I will serve you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. If you've never prayed that prayer before, would you raise your hand real quick so we could see you? Anybody here today you say, hey, that was me. I prayed that for the very first time. I accepted Jesus Christ. Anybody at all? We are all family. Praise God. Amen. If you, didn't, if you didn't feel comfortable raising your hand, but you did pray that prayer, there's a card on the seat back in front of you. You could fill that out, or you could text Jesus to the number that's on that card and take it to the back, uh, the back table here. If you want to talk to somebody, if you want prayer, we have people standing at the tables in the back that would love to meet you, that would love to pray with you, that would love to help inspire your walk. If you accept Jesus today, they will give you a book that we wrote here in-house that talks about Christianity and what the next steps of that walk are going to be. Amen? Let me bless you today. Father, we thank you for speaking to our hearts today. We thank you for a renewed vision of worship, a heart connected to yours. Lord, as we leave here, I bless everyone in the sound of my voice, that they are the head and not the tail above and never beneath. Everything they set their hands to will prosper and be successful. They were blessed coming in. They'll be blessed going out. We thank you for your protection and your safety in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. We love you. Have a great weekend.